Welcome back to Beyond the Desk. Today, we're going to be talking about renting long-term in Colombia. Hi, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes. I like your ho, ho, ho. Oh, you got going yeah. On. All decked out in my onesie today. I got my best friends. I see that. Have, yep. They're bros. Um, drinking eggnog. So it's Christmas Day. It is Christmas Day. Yeah. So it's it's interesting that we're recording <clears throat> specifically on Christmas Day because normally when we, re- we record once a week and normally we record um, approximately a week before we launch. Right. But our last episode, I had just gotten over something and I was clearing my throat and turning the microphone down. And And then you you shared it with me. Yes. You got what I had and it was nasty. Yes. We were both down for a while. It was not fun at all. Um, And I think we're probably like three weeks into this bug. Yeah. And headed to Florida tomorrow morning. Yeah. We're good now. And you've been on antibiotics, so you're, you know, everything's good there. But we do still have this like residual uh, coffee, cleary. So if you see us popping cough drops, that's the reason. Right. Why. Yeah. So yeah. today we're going to be talking about living, renting, renting long term in Colombia. And some of the things that we uh, have been looking at so far with we're our still checklist. Uncovering. Yeah, we're still uncovering. We're still figuring out what is absolutely the best thing to do. Um, what does right look like? But also, we have to constantly remind ourselves we are not cookie cuttering ourselves and mm-hmm. embedding ourselves somewhere else. We are moving to someplace else and embracing what they have. And we're constantly researching. So what may have been good for us a month ago may change in the next month if we've made a friend, which so far I've made three friends in right. Colombia so far. So right. these are people that we are going to be able to talk to that are on the up and up, if you will. Right. To be able to help us out. No, exactly. And that's, that's important. And I think that's a, that's a big thing that people can do is they can begin connecting. Like we connect it with our Airbnb person yeah. who we're renting from. Right. And I think that's a pretty substantial relationship. Mm-hmm. Plus if you hadn't continued on with trying to um, get to know this person beyond them, just being our host, we would never have uncovered that they're actually from Ohio. Right. One state he away, is, right? Mateo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one state away. Um, and that's huge. That's huge for us. Like, totally relatable. But now we have a little bit of an insider of right. um, how to navigate some things. And we might even be able to uh, lean on Mateo if if we're there. And Well, he's already offered. He and his wife, Jessica, they have both already offered to help us out and they get it. Show us the way because they yeah. they do get it. They have an Airbnb, beautiful Airbnb with Colombian art in it. Just oh, it's just beautiful. I can't wait to see it in person. I'm um, in Sabaneta. So There's something I really know. Something interesting I noticed about the rentals um, and some of the buildings as I continue to go through them, uh, especially when I was looking at purchasing an apartment. I was looking. We have a real estate guy that yeah. has been sending us stuff, and um, a lot of the buildings are like. Straight up twigs. They're not like these big giant, they're, they're high up 15, 20 They're stories. high rises for sure. But what I noticed is in the listings, it would say four units per level. And what that means is each unit is on a corner. Mm-hmm. So you have daylight on two sides. Where you often, just discovered this the other day. I just day. discovered this. And oftentimes, at least in my experience here in Michigan, but I'm sure it's in other places as well, when you're renting uh, an apartment, a lot of times you you own, you have your hallway you have your shared sides yeah. and you only have that one wall of natural light coming in. Um, and here you're getting to a lot Ooh, of the yeah. listings we, we're getting their corners, which is yeah. just phenomenal. I don't know if it's just restrictions and they have to build vertically or if that's by intention of increasing the value of that unit because you get two walls, but it's kind of like the difference between having uh, a cubicle and a corner office. You get that, view from multiple angles. You get lots of natural light. You get light. a nice corner office. Super appealing. <laughs> With the views, usually um, some have balconies, some don't. I That's a non-negotiable for me. I want a balcony. So we're going to start things off with uh, renting like a local. 
Um, and we are going to be talking a bit about the rental process and understanding what that looks like, because there's a difference between doing like an Airbnb rental as um, an American, a gringo, somebody who's foreign to that country. And then with our situation, I am a citizen. Right. So what does that rental process look like? Differences between being just a generic person that's visiting versus somebody who has got the inside scoop, who's yeah. legally documented uh, to rent. And are there differences? And if there are, is it beyond just monetary? There's a big difference. Right. So yeah. um, let's talk a little bit about that. So renting like a local. Well, renting like a local, you are going to get a local price, not a gringo price, which we'll talk about in a minute. You will need a cedula, a Colombian ID. Um, you will need credit. So you have to, if you don't have credit, you need to build your credit and you need a Colombian bank account. So Colombia wants to make sure that you are somebody coming into the country that is able to give back to the people, right? They want people, they want Colombia to prosper. And so they don't want people coming in and, and just, you know, not taking care of the place or just not being able to, you know, to scam or run out on the lease or, or whatever it might be. So they're kind of protective around the local people there, which is a good thing. Absolutely. So what if you don't have a cedula? <clears throat> which is probably the people who are listening to this, the majority of them, strong don't. majority. So you can get a Colombian ID there, right? It's kind of, I don't want to say like a driver's license. I, nobody really drives right there anyway, to my knowledge, <laughs> my understanding. Okay. But you can get a Columbia, um, a Cedula, a Columbian ID. You can open up a bank account. Not every bank will take you without a Cedula. But there are one or two down there that will take a passport. You can open up, but you'll have to do your research and figure out what banks those are, which is what we have to do because this is something that's on our agenda. And we'll have another podcast around our checklist of the things that we want to get done uh, to to really prepare us, you know, for the move down there next year. I'd be curious if there's a difference between the the broad high level differences that I'm always curious about is because I'm a citizen yeah. versus somebody who's considering doing this based off of like a digital nomad, mm -hmm. right? Because they're most of them are. 100% U.S., they don't have citizenship there, so they're on a visa. Yeah. Where we have citizenship, residency, well, not you owned, do. but I have those inside things. And if there's a difference because I have a Colombian passport versus a U.S. passport under a visa, right? And those are things we're going to have to explore is what can we take advantage of because I'm a citizen, right? We might be able to bypass some things. We might have easier ways of doing things. We might have lower requirements with right. things being uh, a citizen. And I know in 2024, there are a lot of things that are changing in Colombia. So we're going to have to kind of probably do a lot of this research all over again to find out. But I was made aware a couple of months ago that as a Colombian citizen, not having um, a, a home purchase there, mm -hmm. you can, they will give you $10,000. Well, I think it's $10,000 US, but I'm not sure what that is in Colombian pesos in order because they want you to stay there as a, as a Colombian citizen coming from the U S they, they want you to take up residency there. So I think that you have an opportunity, which is why we would need to talk to maybe a real estate attorney which I have one for us now, by the way, right. they do visas, real estate, all of it. And, um, it's next go, next go legal. Um, and you'll make sure that that website is in the description today for the listeners, but you would be able to probably get some help around being a new Colombian citizen right. in order to purchase property or land or whatever you want to. But for those that don't have that bonus <laughs> that you have, um, <clears throat> my apologies, my voice um, may go. 
during this episode, but um, you don't want to pay gringo prices. So there's, you also have to be very careful of scams. Think don't ever, we've talked about this in a previous podcast. Don't ever give anybody a deposit over the phone or over the internet or anything. Wait till you get there. They, you know, they take you to actually see it, right? Meet somebody in person. Don't ever, ever do anything over the phone or over the internet because you will, that's a scam. So you need to make sure if you, please be able to speak Spanish. If you don't, find somebody that you can pay for the day to interpret for you um, and for them, you know, a translator. Um, They're not going to understand you. You're not going to understand them. And it's going to probably cause some tension and it's just a barrier, right? In order to break that, you want to have somebody help you out with that. Well, so you're you're no longer a local at that point. You're not renting like a local, you're renting like a gringo. And we're going to talk about gringo pricing a little bit. So um, the strata system is an important element. And um, it's essentially like the social classes, right? One through six. One through six. So if we, so we're in Michigan and we, because we've lived here for so long, we know ours, ours are kind of like counties where they're really big and we know like where the money is in specific counties, but even within that county, there are less affluent areas and there's more affluent areas, right? So we could easily, if somebody were moving here, be able to say, you'll get a very low price here, but it's not as safe. Or you can go here, pay a little bit more, but it's safer and the right. schools are better, right? It's similar to that, right? So what you want to do is get yourself familiarized with the strata system and choose a neighborhood that makes sense for you. And the interesting thing about this is you could have um, a border between stratas and we'll just call it number four, number five. Maybe not number six is like the top upper class, but maybe you're number four, number five. And, you know, I teach my clients this. Look at look at the zip codes here and find out where do you yeah. want to do business? Where do you want to find people from? Because you want people that can afford your services. Sure. So inject yourself in a place that financially makes sense for your business, but also will you can easily attract people. Um we can do the same thing, find those borders, and it's possible you could rent or own in a one step down if it meets your requirement, but still be close enough to the one step up to live in that sort of area. And it's kind of like what we're doing right now. So we're yeah. in a school system that would typically be considered a lower school system, school of choice, but our property taxes are lower because of that. But literally across the street is a different school system that is higher um, and so we have lower taxes and yet we can shop and purchase and right, be able right here, safe yeah, in within the area. walking distance. Literally right there. So you can do that sort of thing, but you have to familiarize, familiarize yourself with, in this case in Columbia, the strata system, but also like where the um, socioeconomic areas are. Right. And you're going to be, you, you'll note if you're walking around or you're with your real estate agent, you'll notice things like garages. You'll notice things like yards. You'll notice things, fence. You'll notice things if it's um, two walls that you get on a rental versus being boxed, um, like Tessa's old apartment, right? Yeah. It was just this huge high rise with just, you know, and we all go through it. But you can research, find out the areas you want to be. And then start looking at pricing then. Don't go strictly based on pricing. Make sure the pricing makes sense for the area and yes. the class that's in there as well. Yeah. And and do they don't technically have MLS list. They don't have an MLS listing in Colombia. They don't have real estate agents. Anybody can be a real estate agent there, call themselves that. Um, it is not at all like what we have here in the States. So you have to get with somebody that is trustworthy. And that is because they are, they make a commission. And so they are out to get that commission. They are not necessarily concerned about your needs. Right. So you have to really do your research and reach out and get in contact with some of them. Um, You are not going to get anywhere with an email. Typically I have with two of them. One was from the States originally and he, her, his colleague, she was, has been pretty good about that as well, but typically it's by WhatsApp. And, and so email they is, should get, yeah. is an American style it communication. Like we're mm-hmm. dependent on email. That's like our preferred 
um, type of communication yeah. for non-emergency, non-mandatory right away things, right? Yeah. Where their WhatsApp is where you're going to get with that is what, yeah, that's where you're going to get. And um, I can't stand <laughs> when people communicate with me via text message for things that I have to take action on. Because once I read it, that notification's gone, out of, it's gone. It's gone out of my yeah. mind, right? But an email, I can mark that unread and go back to it and cre- use it as a task. That's and sad. maybe it's the way I do things. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but that's the way I do things. And so text message, I've got a client who all he does is text me um, with, hey, can we do this? What does this look like? What's the login? And if I'm in the middle of something, so in, with iPhone, you can peek at text. So, yeah. I can, so I peek so it doesn't mark it unread to see this is something I need to do right now or not. <laughs> But WhatsApp would be difficult for me. Unless on WhatsApp, you can mark it on red. Anyways, communication is it's different. It's going to be a transition for you, I think, when it comes to to dealing with Oh, that. there's a lot of things that I'm going to have to work on. And their customer service, let's be real, they don't get back to you immediately. I mean, it could be days later. It could be hours later. Yeah. Um, but I, I can also tell you guys, um, AK Joel on YouTube, he is a great source, great source of information and also, Andrew with the Medellin, he, he calls it Medellin, yeah. the Medellin buzz, buzz. Medellin buzz. Uh, he's also an excellent, excellent um, resource, resource for everybody. So, and that's where I get a lot of my information from because they are trustworthy. They live there. AK is originally from Australia and Andrew is from Colombia, raised in the United States and ended up getting deported when he was younger and sent back to Colombia. And he has really done quite well for himself. But he's been back there, what, 13 years 13 or years he's been back yeah. there. AK Joel has been there for five years. You can sign up for their newsletter. They have a free checklist on there they that you can use. They go live on YouTube regularly and just take Live questions. on YouTube every week. The, um, any donations, they often just do it to a local charity or kids organization to yep. help support. So, like right now they're doing it when you donate to purchase Christmas gifts for kids. Shoes. They purchased a hundred shoes for a hundred children. So, so like good hearted people that are literally out there to help people understand yeah. before they take the plunge. Yeah. And quite possibly they may be who we hire to help us move. Right. So. Right. Cause they, they're able to do all the logistical things and understand how to navigate that. They're where, both fluent in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so let's go ahead and. Let's let's move on to cost comparisons. Um, there's a couple of things I want to go over there. Um, so I think it's pretty well established that we our our, our bougie asses are looking to be right around a strata five five out of six. Yeah. Um, and we're doing that. It seems like we're. It seems like on the surface level, people might think we're doing that uh, for taking our U.S. lifestyle and injecting it there. But safety is our number one thing. Absolutely. And when we when we embed ourselves, we want to do it in a way where we feel safe. Mm-hmm. Where we know that we are in a safe environment. So there's gated gated communities and different things there. And, and, and there's going to be benefits of right. um, you know beyond safety, like you know nicer places. And but the core purpose is safety. Yeah. Right. So. Is, does that make an Estrada for not safe? Not necessarily. But if we're able to choose and if it's within the budget to go into a five, we're not looking for six. We're looking for just to be comfortable, safe, be able to pick up the mail, not have to look over our shoulders. Um, that's the important piece. And this is also, this will be our first long-term stay there as well. So the amount of knowledge that we will gain from living there for five months is huge so that when we go back the next year, we'll have even more uh, knowledge around what to do, what not to do. Right. So this is also kind of a learn as you go as well. Big time. Um, so let's put into perspective uh, strata five. So the scale was one through five, or one through six. One through six. And six being like your most affluent area, right? Um, we're looking for a five, a two bedroom, two bathroom, which is what we have currently. Um, we're at, you know, we're in a condo, so we are co-owners of this place with other condo association members. Um, you know, so if we go into an apartment that's two bedroom, two bathroom furnished, and again, we're talking about um, the rental process, right? We're talking long-term, about long-term rental. Furnished. Um, 
in Sabaneta, we're looking at a cost. What are the numbers there? So we could probably get anywhere. Just, it really depends. Um, you furnished is going to be more expensive than unfurnished. I don't know why in the world somebody would rent an unfurnished and then furnish it and then leave without owning it. Um, but clearly some pe people do uh, to get that lower cost. So we could go anywhere from 500 to $800 a month just based on what we want. Um, but even at $800 a month, we're going to have a pool. We're going to have a gym. We're probably going to have a sauna. You know, there's going to be a ton of things. Right. There's going to be a co-working space more than likely, you know, yeah. that we'll have available to us on top of that. And so. People are going to say 500 bucks. That's, that's super cheap. And the reality is it is an inexpensive. And of course it's part of the attraction of, you know, countries that are not the U S is that there's a, still a developing company or I mean country <laughs> yeah, that there's affordability available. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, because we're doing part-time and I think we'll get to this, uh, we're still going to be keeping our place here. Mm -hmm. So we're not switching costs. We're reallocating some stuff, but some stuff will still stay right. Our mortgage here will stay our insurance here will stay. Our HOA fees will stay, right? Um, our cost for our car will stay. So there's things that will still statically be US-based expenses right. that are still here. So what that means is we are adding to our costs, not reallocating, right? So we have to be able to afford that. We have to be able to afford that. So it's and and we're putting things into place to figure that out. And I think we're going to be talking about that on our next episode. Um, some of the things we're doing to, you know, really look at the finances, look at the business, and what we have to do in order to be able to not only afford it but grow. For sure. And you know, as a gringo, gringa and gringo, that's us, right? Um, which is not a bad word there. It means foreigner. That's the the definition of it. Um, a, easily scammed, trying to rent, right? We've talked about that. Um, but you also can't get an apartment there. They're not going to rent to you if you don't, at least if you don't have a bank account or any of the other things that you need to have, they're going to ask you for a co-signer. Well, who the heck do you know that's going to co-sign for you? Right. Here in the States, would we ever co-sign for somebody we didn't, like, if it wasn't one of the kids? They would have to, like, pay me. It's a lot of sum. Yeah. Right? Which essentially would go. So what that means is if you're a digital nomad and you don't have citizenship, you are you have some work to do. And you probably have some savings you have to create in order to be able to go there for five, six months. Well, they might make you pay all of that up front. And they might make you pay it up front. Right. We have the Which best fair. We have a benefit of I can go there, open up a bank account, begin establishing credit <laughs> to show credibility. Time. Right. So that when it's time for us a year from then or the end of the year to be able to do something, we yeah. should be in a much better position than um, otherwise. So, yeah. So that's the difference of that gringo pricing. Um, but I can tell you for our Airbnb um, in Sabaneta, it is $376 for eight days. What the heck? That is so cheap. So if we were to see, and it's a nice place, it's not. It's, it's beautiful. Not, it's not a. It's not a dumpy yeah, place. It's Great a, ratings. Beautiful place. Right off of Las Vegas, right there. Yeah. Yes, they have a we calle. Start, this calle means street. So we started exploring some of the restaurants and some of the coffee shops around the area, and everything is very close. Nice, great Walk ratings. Distance. So we're 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 in a good place. Yeah. Um, it's not where you and I would want to live for five months though. Correct. Correct. This is the difference between like a hotel room and then getting like renting a house Yeah. when you would go to, you know, on vacation. It is definitely geared more towards like that um, feeling of you're on like a vacation trip right, as right. opposed to your day-to-day -day, every day. There's a, there's a vast difference between the two of them. For sure. Um, Green pricing, right? That, so yeah. Airbnb, um, they do have fees on top of the regular price. So if you were to backtrack that amount, what was the amount? Like 360? What was it? 376. 376. 
Um, most likely there's probably close to like 75 to a hundred bucks in fees that Airbnb is collecting. So realistically that place, what they're asking for the rental is probably closer to 300 bucks. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and you know, they, if they were to book that out, you know, full time, even 70% of the time, um, they're, they're making money there. Oh, they're making bank. If we were to at that same price, and have that place for a month would be about $1,500. I mean, that's expensive uh, there. It's almost, that's almost threefold what right. we're looking at. Where if you're renting like a local, it's- Five to 800. Five to 800 dollars. So big, big difference. Um, you know, and this, I think this is an older, it's not a, a newer, well- it is, but it's not within the past five years. It hasn't, it's not been built within the past five years. Not built, right. Yeah. It, it, it looks like it's been updated and modernized. The newer ones are um, up on the mountain. Well, mountains there in Sabaneta. So. I wouldn't mind becoming mountain folk. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm a mountain <laughs> woman. Um, but yeah, so you want to make sure that you're not paying those gringo prices. And a lot of people, from the states or around the world, when they go to Colombia, they tr they play it safe and they pay Airbnb prices. You really don't want to do that. I mean, you're hanging yourself if you're going down there to. There's a sense of security save money. with that. Sure, I get it. Um, and there's a sense of delegating a lot of the responsibility mm -hmm. by doing that, but at the cost of. If right. You so pay it, go for it. You but I pay think it, it, go for it. But if you really, I mean. For what you pay for an Airbnb, you could probably hire an assistant that would help you find the right place, make sure it's legit, connect you with the right people, help you fill out the paperwork, translate everything for you. Right. And that would be, you know, maybe a hundred, couple hundred bucks of total work. And, maybe. Now you're, and now you're set up. So for like a long, longer term, five, six month thing, mm -hmm. it's worth it to invest into that trusted advisor. Right. And build relationships with people and get to know them. Like we have an attorney and we have um, Mateo as a rental pro. You have to do your homework though. Like you have to make friends. Like I've been doing this now for how many months? Right. And I knew nothing when I started out back in September or October. Our plan was, our plan was the snowbird in Florida. And we said, well, let's go a little further south. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden it came up about you being able to have dual citizenship right. and it just kind of Which, by the way, was an easy process. To, to get your passport. We're still waiting on the cedula. Still waiting on it, but it's just a trip to Chicago. Um, True. The, the, I mean, process-wise, yes, it's, there's there's time. There's right, a right, lot right. of time that's been yeah. happening. Um, but process-wise, literally walk in, I, there was a little bit of pre- Right. Yeah. Verifying I am who I am. But once that part was done, walk in, get my picture, answer some questions, fill out some stuff, sign some paperwork. That was it. It was a day trip. I emailed the Colombian consulate in DC and it just went from there. So you talked about gringo pricing and obviously we want to help. We want to avoid overpaying, um, but there's something else we can do when it comes to the wallet. Um Cash is still king. It right? is still king there. And when you're in America, you can't go to the gas station and say, uh, I'm going to give you 70% of the cost, but I'll pay cash. It doesn't work <laughs> that way, right? You pay the right. sticker price. If you're buying a car, you might be able to, on a one-to-one -one private sale, be able to say, well, listen, I'll give you eight grand, right? In Colombia, having cash gives you negotiating power. And it's not going to be everywhere, but even with our business, our last client that paid us like 960 bucks, we did not get $960 because of credit card processing mm -hmm. fees. And I'm not going to offer them a discount to avoid fees. However, if a client says, can I pay you by check? My answer is absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll wait till it gets mailed to avoid the fees. And it's kind of the same concept of a merchant receiving cash for something may be more willing to let it go for a few bucks less right. because you're giving them cash and you know here in the states some people try to avoid taxes by collecting cash sure. and not reporting it right 
I, I have a feeling in Colombia there might be some practice around that too. That's a little bit less regulated than we have here. Um, but having cash will be a super powerful thing. And in order to get cash, um, there's a couple of things logistically you want to do to get the best rate. Right. You can obviously go to the airport and just exchange U.S. for Colombian, but um, having a bank, having a bank account will give us direct access to cash as well. I just heard today that the forecasters in Colombia, the investors, some investors in Colombia were saying that the Colombian peso was going to be around 6 thousand and where was it 43 last time we checked 39 39 so it fluctuates we're not used to that here in america you know we're not used to not with that much of a fluctuation no way so we'll see but that's crazy big what would that mean for us that's huge well and it also depends which way it's going right because if it's fluctuating in a way that's not in our favor meaning the colombian dollar is becoming more powerful, um, which is where it gets lower, that where you get less of it for the U.S. dollar, then that hurts us. But when it goes the other direction- It's going, it's going the other direction, supposedly. And there's there's a lot of factors that play into that that are beyond my- um, I've never cared to understand money markets and dollar versus euro versus et cetera. I've never- it's not something I've ever cared about. Yeah. But now that we potentially might be dealing in a different currency, that might be something that needs to go on my radar to understand how powerful is our dollar going to be. Um, and maybe when the new year comes in, we can do some and see the changes in Colombia, especially around the Colombian peso. We'll um, maybe we can do a podcast on that because that's pretty important, especially for investment purposes. <laughs> like. It's a big deal. Well, that kind of takes us into, I mean, I know we're going to close out here, but that takes us into what we're talking about next week with um, financial adjustments for our move because we have to take into account money both ways, Um, currency, banking, cost of living. You know, there's there's, there's some stuff we're talking about next week um, that is actually, you did a really good segue there. Um, And the more we do this and the more we learn in our trip down there and so forth and so on, like, again, things can change within a month. A, Columbia changes day to day. Who knows what, you know, laws and pay the peso and, who you know, things are always changing in, in Latin America as a right. whole, right? Um, but then us, as we learn more and really trying to figure out nearing, narrowing it down to exactly what we want. So that's going to change as well. So, you know. It's not nothing that we talk about, I think, with our plans are exact because we're not going to know until we get there and continue to learn more. So we hope everybody has a wonderful holiday and we'll be back um, just after the new year. So until next time, keep expanding your horizons and living beyond the desk. Have an extraordinary holiday week. Happy holiday. Yeah. Mm-hmm.